Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 5J of Useful Genetics, where we're going to introduce the very important two-hit model for cancer. We'll talk about retinal de development and a cancer of infants and small children called retinoblastoma, because this is a very good illustration of the two-hit model in action. We'll talk about sporadic and familial cases of retinoblastoma, and these terms apply to many other genetic diseases, not just cancers. And we'll talk about the two-hit model. So retinoblastoma is a tumor of the retina of the eye, as its name suggests. Here's a photo micrograph, the kind that would be seen by an ophthalmologist, showing the tumor as a white area growing on the surface of the retina. Retinoblastoma is often discovered sort of by chance because in photographs the where normal people um, will often produce what's called red eye when their photograph is taken with a flash because the retina reflects back red. If there's a tumor in the retina, the retina may reflect back white or just red with a white spot. In normal eye development, which is quite a cool thing, um, it starts, the eye starts just as a depression in a layer of cells on the surface of the embryonic head. And that depression forms a cup, and the cells inside the cup um, divide and differentiate to form the retina, the light-sensitive tissue of the eye. And retinoblastoma occurs when there's a mutation in the gene named RB for retinoblastoma. This gene encodes a protein whose normal job is to delay or inhibit cell division as the retina matures and it's time for the cells, the retinoblasts, the retinal precursor cells to stop dividing. But somatic mutations are quite common in retinoblasts, perhaps because they have to divide very rapidly to produce the, the very high de density of cells in our retina that gives us such sharp vision. So here's a question that should take you back to um, Module 4, but don't go back and look at Module 4. Instead, just think this question through. Given that the retinoblastoma gene encodes a protein that normally delays or inhibits cell division when cells shouldn't divide, what kind of mutation in RB would create an allele that causes cancer? Would it be a loss of function mutation or a promoter activation mutation? And would that mutation be dominant or recessive to the normal allele? The mutation would be, the mutations it's needed is a loss of function mutation. I'll illustrate this in just a sec. And it would be expected to be recessive to the normal allele. So normally, Although one copy has lost its function, the other allele, the other copy, is able to do its job, and so the phenotype is still normal. Now here's a second question. Again, this is stuff we covered in Module 4, but just think about what the words mean. You don't need to go back and look up the answer. The retinoblastoma gene codes a protein that delays or inhibits cell division. What kind of a gene is it in the terminology used by cancer biologists. This is terminology that was developed when the genes were discovered by their effects on cancer. So retinoblastoma is what's called a tumor suppressor gene. That's because when a normal copy is present, the ability to form tumors is suppressed. A cell's cell division is suppressed. But when the gene is missing, then a tumor can form. So the two-hit model of cancer initiation says that many cancers are initiated by mutations in genes like the retinoblastoma gene, genes whose normal function is to prevent cell growth. These are what are called tumor suppressor genes. But because these mutant alleles are usually recessive to the normal allele, a tumor is only going to begin to grow if both alleles of this gene are non-functional. 
that's the two hits. The gene has to take two hits before a tumor will develop, a hit in each allele. So here's that same situation from the perspective of the regulatory interactions diagrams that we used in module four. So I've renamed what we were calling the stop gene, I've named it the RB gene, but the RB gene is functioning as a stop gene. So in um, early in retinal development, the RB gene is inactive and the cells are able to divide. But Late in embryonic, late in retinal development, the RB gene becomes active and it shuts down the genes that allow cell division. It effectively says, don't grow. If there's a single mutation in one allele of RB knocking it out, doesn't matter, the cell still won't grow. But if both alleles are knocked out, then the RB function is lost and the cell is able to grow and the cell carries out unregulated growth, causing tumor formation. So the two-hit model of cancer initiation explains the occurrence of two kinds of family histories, two kinds of retinoblastoma. There are cases that are described as sporadic and cases that are described as familial. In sporadic cases, there's no cases in relatives. There aren't any relatives known to have retinoblastoma. But in familial cases, there are relatives known to have retinoblastoma. And these two kinds of retinoblastoma are approximately equal in frequency. But they're quite different in causation. In both cases, the tumor has suffered two hits. Both its alleles of RB are knocked out. But in sporadic retinoblastoma, the child has inherited two functional RB alleles. And it's only during retinal development that mutations have occurred in both alleles in the same RB cell. In familial cases, the child has inherited one defective allele. So all it's needed to generate the tumor precursor cell is a single somatic mutation in the other allele of any cell in the retina. So here's its diagrammed in a little more detail. In sporadic retinoblastoma, or sporadic occurrences of many other cancers that arise in the same way from inactivation of what's called a tumor suppressor gene, a growth suppressing gene. The child begins with gametes that both carry normal alleles and so the embryo is genetically normal. But two mutations occur during embryonic development in the retinal cell. They have to have occurred in the same cell lineage to produce one cell that has two mutations. This cell then forms rapidly dividing cells that lack retinoblastoma protein and forms a tumor. In familial retinoblastoma, uh, the first hit has already happened in one of the parents, or perhaps earlier, in a grandparent. And one of the gametes carries a defective RB allele. This then results in an embryo that's heterozygous for a mutant allele. And now it only takes one RB mutation in any cell in the retina to create the tumor precursor cell that will divide and develop into the tumor. Because the RB cells the mutant cells grow rapidly, usually the tumor becomes evident during the first year or two of the child's life. Now, there are other ways, factors that distinguish sporadic and familial cancers, um, certainly for retinoblastoma. With sporadic retinoblastoma, the tumor usually develops in only one eye. This makes sense because it's only going to happen in those rare individuals where two 
RB minus mutations have happened in the same cell lineage. That's very unlikely to occur in both eyes of a per person with a normal genotype. In familial cancer, it usually occurs in both eyes. And that's because the odds of a RB minus mutation happening in one allele in at least one retinal cell are actually very, very high. And so usually people with familial retinoblastoma develop retinoblastoma tumors in both eyes, often more than one tumor in a single eye. People with sporadic retinoblastoma usually don't have any increased risk of other tissues because their other tissues are all genetically normal. But people with familial retinoblastoma may develop cancer in other tissues later. The retina is the most sensitive target and the most sensitive cell that's affected by retinoblastoma mutations. But because the retinoblastoma gene protein has many functions, acts in many cells, cancer can also develop in other cells. Finally, um, you may be wondering about the numbers here. Why would the numbers of sporadic and familial cases be roughly similar when the causes are so different? Well, in familial retinoblastoma, once the single mutation is present, the probability of a mutation in a single retinal, retinal cell is very high. But these alleles inherited retinoblastoma alleles are very rare. So we have a very rare event inheriting a retinoblastoma allele and a relatively common event, one retinoblastoma mutation happening in one retinal cell in the developing eye. In sporadic cases, everybody else falls into this category. So only one in 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 people falls into this category. Everybody else is in this category. But the chance of two retinoblastoma mutations happening in the same cell is very low. So again, we have a big number and a small number. Here, it's a small number and a big number. But the net effect is roughly the same. Now, I mentioned that retinoblastoma, the protein, has a lot of tasks. It actually re regulates aspects of cell growth and division in many different cell types, and it's been found to interact with many, many proteins. There's about 60 proteins here that retinoblastoma interacts, the protein retinoblastoma interacts with. And here's a diagram showing all of the interaction that goes on that are influenced by retino the retinoblastoma protein. This is another example of the kind of gene network that explains why every genetic difference affects many different phenotypic differences. So we've reviewed some relationships and terminology that we first brought up in Module 4, and we've introduced two new terms, familial and sporadic. These terms don't just apply to cancer risk, they can also apply to other um, genetically specified phenotypes, especially ones where there's um, incomplete what's called penetrance. Remember the term penetrance from Module 4 as well, where in some cases individuals inherited a genetic predisposition to this, to the trait, and in other cases it arose spontaneously by a new mutation. We've introduced the two-hit model for cancer initiation using the retinoblastoma gene as an example because, because single people with a single mutation in retinoblastoma have such a high frequency of cancer. It forms a very good demonstration of the model. And we've explained why inherited heterozygous mutations in genes that limit cell growth can be risk factors risk factors for the development of cancer. Coming up next, we're going to extend this analysis to cases where the relationships are a little more difficult to decipher, and that's the BRCA1 and BRCA2 alleles that cause a high risk of breast cancer. I hope to see you there.